the goal of this, um, these educational uh, events are to, you know, really get everybody on board uh, so that we could broadly adopt these, what we believe to be best practices. Um, so I'll introduce Dylan first. Dylan is our medical director at Swedish Medical Center. Uh, he's president of the medical staff at uh, Swedish, uh, as well as chief of staff at uh, St. Vincent's Hospital in Leadville. Uh, he also has a very strong EMS background and he's the uh, EMS medical director for a number of uh, agencies in the metro area, uh, including Castle Rock. Um, so Dylan has been our champion for uh, advocating for the use of monotherapy with phenobarbital for alcohol withdrawal. Um, he's been doing a ton of education for the physicians and nurses and uh, on the EDN hospital side. So uh, without further ado, I will uh, send it over to Dylan. Thanks so much for the introduction. I really appreciate that. This is exciting. Uh, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. Today, we're going to be talking about phenobarbital monotherapy for alcohol withdrawal. And really, my goal today is to change your practice. Um, we're going to talk about the pathophysiology of alcohol withdrawal. And again, my goal is to convince you that uh, there's really a better way to do it than the way that we have done it for the past 25 years or so. Uh, and then we'll go over some kind of common uh, frequently asked questions, do's and don'ts, et cetera. So it, to understand this, you really have to uh, uh, fundamentally understand the neurochemistry of alcohol withdrawal. So alcohol causes sedation both by inhibiting the uh, GABA receptors, which open chloride channels and cause um, kind of uh, hyperpolarization of the, of the uh, membranes uh, in our central nervous system, as well as it inhibits the excitatory uh, and MDA glutamate receptors in the CNS. And so long-term alcohol use then leads to predictable downregulation of those GABA receptors, as well as upregulation of the glutamate receptors, as well as increased synthesis of all of the excitatory neurotransmitters in response to that chronic suppression of that excitatory neurotransmission. And so when we see patients in alcohol withdrawal, really what we're seeing is the unmasking of this increased excitatory tone. Uh, and that's what results in all of the adrenergic signs that we're familiar with, the tachycardia, the tremulousness, the sweating, the agitation, as well as the seizures. So this is kind of a, a, a graphical illustration of the uh, point I just made, which is that uh, in kind of the homeostatic non-alcoholic state, we've got a balanced uh, uh, effect of the uh, GABA uh, activity against the glutamate activity. And when we, as a non, you know, heavy drinker, non-alcoholic, have a few too many glasses of wine, uh, the alcohol and GABA effect kind of counterbalances or overbalances the glutamate effect, and we get intoxicated and a little sedated. And by comparison, the alcoholic in, its, in, in, in his or her chronic kind of state has that constant alcohol level working with those down-regulated GABA receptors offset by those upregulated glutamate receptors, and they're kind of in balance. And then in withdrawal, that glutamate effect, it, which has been upregulated, is now the predominant one, and that's what we recognize as the alcohol withdrawal state. So phenobarb has unique pharmacology, which makes it ideal for managing alcohol withdrawal. Uh, we will go over each of these uh, these aspects in, in greater detail, but it can be summarized by the fact that uh, phenobarb is loaded rather than up titrated, which makes it very efficient in our busy, distracted state as emergency physicians in the ER. It provides very predictable drug levels. It has a very long half-life, making it essentially self-tapering. And its chemistry is, is really perfect in that it both directly uh, affects GABA receptors and directly inhibits glutamate receptors. And lastly, rarely needed for us in the ER, but can be quite helpful for our colleagues in the hospital, you can check a level. So let's start by talking about the relationship of dosing to levels, because this is kind of essential to understanding how we administer phenobarb in the ER. Phenobarbital serum levels are a linear function of the amount of phenobarbital administered. So this means weight-based dosing gives you very predictable serum drug levels. 
uh, we do dose it uh, based on ideal body weight, which is worth, worth understanding. So for example, our typical load in the ER of 10 milligrams per kilogram will yield a serum drug level of around 15 micrograms per ml, which is kind of the low range of uh, therapeutic level for epilepsy, but four times lower than that level where we, we, we expect significant toxicity from phenobarb, which is around 65 mics per ml. It's important to remember though that um, when we talk about that 10, kilo, 10 per kilo load, that if the patient already received, you know, multiple rounds of benzos or some other sedating medicine, or they're partially obtunded from a head injury or something, that this dose, while totally uh, safe in, 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 in most patients, could, could tip one of those more vulnerable patients over to being, to being over sedated. We'll come back to that. So this is a little bit of a busy slide, but again, it's a graphical representation of what I just said. And this is based on um, uh, a lot of work that's been done in the epilepsy space with you know, decades of experience with phenobarbital. And if you look at the graphs uh, on the screen, what you see are the, the space between the two green lines, which represent kind of the therapeutic range for epilepsy. And then the upper red line, which is 65 uh, micrograms per ml, which represents the kind of threshold for serious toxicity, which is, by the way, typically sort of ataxia, nystagmus, over sedation, uh, all of the things that you would expect really with any, any uh, CNS uh, depressing drug. And that yellow line representing kind of the, the um, lower limit where those side effects are typically seen. So in other words, as long as we keep people in that serum range between the two green lines, which is between uh, 15 and, 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 uh, and, and around 35, we really don't see any, any significant toxicity from phenobarb. And then what you see with that is that linear relationship. So essentially what we're, what we're demonstrating is that um, very predictably based on the milligram dose per kilo of phenobarb, you'll see kind of a predictable linear a uh, rising line in terms of the serum level, which we'll come back to. So how do we give it? It's pretty easy. You can think of the milligram per kilogram dose multiplied by 1.5 to get your expected serum dose. So there's few medicines that we deal with that are as predictable as phenobarb in that regard. What I do is I start with a loading dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram ideal body weight, expecting a serum level again of 15. And if you think of that as the sort of lower range for uh, uh, therapeutic doses in epilepsy, we don't expect that patient to be overly sedated, just like the epileptic who's walking around with a, with a uh, therapeutic level isn't, isn't or shouldn't be overly sedated. Then after I've loaded the patient, if they're still looking like they need additional treatment for their alcohol withdrawal, and we'll come back to their RAS score, uh, then I basically give them little aliquots of 130 milligrams every 10 to 15 minutes until I've achieved a RAS of zero or minus one. Uh, it's very important when you're giving phenobarb in this model uh, that you keep track of the cumulative dose because that's an important part of your handoff to the next provider, whether that's the intensivist or, or, the, or the hospitalist on the floor. In terms of how much you can give, uh, what, what, what we recommend is kind of a soft stop at 20 milligrams per kilogram, and then a hard stop at 30 milligrams per kilogram ideal body weight, total cumulative dose. Way I think about that is I don't have any qualms about you know, continuing to give bumping you know, the dose up to 20 at that point, I really want to reevaluate the patient because in my mind, that's where we start to think about, should we really be starting a non-GABA drug like dexmedetomidine or ketamine or some other, some other drug, perhaps Haldol, um, because we're, we're probably getting about as much GABA effect as we're going to get. But I know talking to my colleagues in the ICU that they feel very comfortable going up to 30 mg per kg, which again, should give you a level of around 45, uh, which is kind of that, the, the, the lowest level where we start to see the ataxia and everything from the phenobar, but well below that 65 level where we think of real, real toxicity occurring. So um, 
while I'm talking about these levels, let's just quickly touch on, on when, if ever, we would get a phenobarb level. So I, I really think it's essentially almost never uh, needed in the emergency department setting. The exception being uh, when you're thinking about the, a patient presenting with phenobarb toxicity. And I do wonder, I've yet to see a case of this, but I think we should be sort of on the lookout for it, given that phenobarb has become increasingly popular around the country and certainly quite popular in the Denver market. I think there's a world where a patient could be getting a phenobarb load at Denver Health on Monday and then another phenobarb load at university on, on Tuesday and then another phenobarb load at, at Swedish on Wednesday. And I think eventually we're gonna start seeing patients coming in who you know, already have a therapeutic phenobarb level uh, and they're coming in as alcohol intoxication or you know, too drunk for detox or one of these complaints. And so I, th I do think we should keep that in the back of our mind in our differential diagnosis of the altered alcoholic in Denver. I do think it can be very useful for people in the hospital uh, who may perhaps have lost track of how much phenobarb the patient has received. So for example, if, if you were on the floor you know, taking care of a patient and 24 hours after their admission, they were looking a little bit more agitated or tremulous and you, you'd lost track of it, you could get a level. And if their level's over 30, they certainly don't need any more phenobarb and probably need you know, to be worked up for another cause of their agitation or maybe just started on Presidex and put in the ICU. Or if their level's you know, five or something very low, they, then they, you feel very comfortable you know, reloading or continuing to load the patient. It's important to note that nobody really knows what the ideal therapeutic level is for DTs. Uh, and when we talk about sort of therapeutic levels, really we're just extrapolating data from the epilepsy literature. But I think that's a, you know, probably a pretty reliable um, starting point, at least in terms of thinking about toxicity. And again, I, I've already mentioned the, the, uh, those target levels of 15 to 40. So again, why, why phenobarb versus benzodiazepines? And I, I've touched on these indirectly, but to, to, to say specifically, the first is phenobarb's more predictable pharmacokinetics. So this linear dose uh, uh, to level relationship does not exist with benzos. And depending on the benzo you're choosing, you know, some of them are short acting like, like Midaz or, or Ativan, some are relatively long acting like Valium or Transine, some have lots of uh, active metabolites like Valium, some, some really don't like, uh, like Ativan, but very, very uh, highly variable metabolism uh, with your benzos compared to phenobarb. The second is these very predictable pharmacodynamics like I talked about. Um, we really don't know when we give a dose of benzo kind of whether that's going to be effective or ineffective. And probably some of that is due to the fact that um, while uh, phenobarbital is a direct uh, agonist of the GABA receptors, you know, in other words, it binds to the GABA receptor and then turns it on. Uh, by comparison, benzodiazepines, what they do is they bind the GABA receptor and sort of hold it open and hold it uh, increase its avidity, if you will, for the endogenous GABA. So for benzos to work, you actually need uh, good endogenous GABA levels. And we know that some alcoholics, probably as a function of their poor nutrition and otherwise, and also probably a function of their downregulated receptors, actually have very poor endogenous GABA supplies, which we think probably explains those patients who are very benzo refractive. So we've all seen those patients who are getting 30, 40, 50 plus, you know, milligrams of Ativan and aren't really responding anymore. And that's probably due to not having any endogenous GABA. And we don't really see that occurring with, with phenobarb. The next is that very wide therapeutic index with phenobarb. So like I said, you know, giving somebody 10 per kilo is in my experience, barely even sedating for most patients. And I'm really struck by what we used to think was this huge dose of phenobarb. You know, when I, when I typically reevaluate my patient, you know, 30 minutes after they've got it, they're often just normal. They're not sleepy, they're just normal. Uh, and very, again, very, very wide uh, therapeutic index for this drug. And then lastly, very long half-life. So the half-life is kind of three to four to five days and so this is perfect, given that that's about how long most alcohol withdrawal lasts. So it, it functions essentially as a self-tapering drug. Uh, 
which both makes it easier to care for these patients in the hospital, but also makes it easy to discharge these patients uh, who don't typically require uh, prescriptions for home. So let's talk a little bit about cautions and contraindications. Um, and there are a few that are absolute, but more of them are relative. So in terms of absolute contraindications, I would be, I would avoid them uh, in patients who are on antiretrovirals for HIV. And this is due to the well-known uh, complicated drug interactions with HIV medicines. So again, it's probably not gonna cause a problem in the patient acutely in the ER, but it could cause a problem down the road for them if they're maintained on this for longer. The second is the mythic uh, patient with acute intermittent porphyria, which you know maybe maybe these people exist in our practice, but they're certainly they're certainly vanishingly rare, and luckily isn't likely to be of great practical consideration for us. The third one I think is the one that probably is the most uh, potentially confusing, and that's patients with advanced cirrhosis and a history of hepatic encephalopathy. And obviously a little challenging because some of our alcoholics, you know, are obviously at high risk of, of cirrhotic or even have cirrhotic liver disease. But I wanna be clear, it, it's not the case that just because someone has cirrhosis, I don't give them phenobar, but it's the patient who, you know, deeply jaundiced, a little lethargic, you know, has a huge belly full of ascites, is on, you know, lactulose and, and so forth and so on at home. Those are patients where we should probably avoid it. Um, I think it would be not unreasonable to try a dose in a patient who had, you know, who's refractory to other treatments, but as a first line uh, drug, it probably wouldn't, wouldn't favor it. But again, th these patients are actually fairly uncommon in terms of the ones we're seeing in acute alcohol withdrawal. The, these guys are usually presenting more with encephalopathy than, than true withdrawal. The problem is that these patients uh, can develop just kind of very prolonged sedation from phenobarb due to their impaired drug clearance. And then, you know, the patients I'd be cautious are patients who've already received a lot of benzodiazepines um, or patients who are on lots of other sedating medications. Just again, we can expect synergistic, uh, synergistic uh, sedating effects. And then the other one, where you know I, I like to like to talk about a lot when I'm you know teaching people about this or you know working with my mid-level providers and things is I, I don't go I don't I don't use this right out of the gate if the diagnosis is unclear you know and we certainly see a lot of patients in the ER who come in and they're claiming to be an alcohol withdrawal but they look intoxicated and you know they're probably more anxious than they are in withdrawal. Uh, and those patients, you know, if you're, if you're questioning whether the patient's vital sign abnormalities or symptoms are due to alcohol withdrawal, what I like to do is give them a milligram of Ativan IV. Uh, and if that kind of fixes all their problems, they're probably not in alcohol withdrawal because a true, you know, alcoholic is not going to be fixed with a milligram of Ativan. You know, that's probably something else going on. And so they probably just don't need the phenobarb. We could talk separately about whether those patients should have prophylactic phenobarb, and I'm going to touch on that in a further slide. But that's not a patient I would load, you know, necessarily in the ER with a big, big IV, big IV dose. So um, I do want to uh, make sure this is uh, somewhat evidence-based, and I'm just going to present two studies that are useful. Uh, this is a study uh, from 2013, actually from uh, Denver Health, and basically what they looked at was um, in the setting of at the time, those benzodiazepine withdrawals or benzodiazepine shortages we were all experiencing, they, they looked at um, uh, uh, the uh, comparing two groups randomly in a, in a controlled fashion uh, between loading with IV phenobarb in the ER versus standard CWA approach. And basically what they found is those patients that were loaded up front with, with uh, phenobarb in the ER had a decreased need for uh, ICU admission which certainly in our, our resource uh, uh, depleted environment is incredibly valuable to us. Uh, the second is a study out of, actually out of Nashville, uh, Tennessee, another prospective uh, study which looked at uh, phenobarb loading compared to standard CWAP benzo uh, protocols for alcohol withdrawal. And basically they found the same thing, which is that phenobarb not only reduced the need for ICU admission, uh, but also decreased the overall ICU and hospital lengths of stay uh, compared to CWAR protocol. Uh, 
So this is evidence uh, based, you know, and I think the reason, in my opinion, why that why we see these favorable results is that it's probably easier to control people more aggressively up front with phenobarb because it's loaded rather than gradually up titrated. So it's probably easier to get out in front of these patients' symptoms rather than kind of constantly playing catch up uh, with, uh, with titrated benzo protocols. So I wanna make a plug for the use of the Richmond Agitation and Sedation Score or RAS. Uh, RAS is uh, one of those things like uh, the blue versus red pill in Matrix that once you've taken the pill, uh, you're really never going back. It's just so much easier to use and so much more intuitive, reproducible. Uh, by comparison, Siwa is so cumbersome, you know, labor intensive, uh, complicated, and I suspect uh, with pretty poor interrater reliability uh, amongst our, amongst our uh, poor overworked nurses uh, that I really think RAS is a better way to go. And the way I think about RAS, the way I explain it to my nurses is basically we're shooting, we're always shooting for a RAS of zero, which is all of you on this call. Hopefully, uh, you know, maybe a few of you are minus one right now from the naturally sedating effect of my voice. But um, the the uh, it's really very simple. A RAS of zero is your goal. That's an alert, calm patient. Uh, a RAS of one is someone who you can lightly touch their shoulder or call their name, and they should promptly open their eyes and respond to you. Um, and really the sweet spot for these folks who we're trying to manage with DTs or alcohol or gel in the ER is a, is a zero to minus one. And if they're anything above a zero, I'm giving more phenobarb. And if they're, if they're at a minus one, I'm stopping. So it's really very, very easy. Uh, and we've been sort of incrementally chipping away at educating our nurses on this as well. So just a plug, I don't think this is something that we're necessarily doing uh, uh, much of uh, right now in the ER, but I have begun doing this in a few selected patients that I'm admitting to the trauma service or admitting to the medicine service with a pneumonia, for example. And that is uh, uh, prophylactically uh, loading people with phenobarb. Uh, the PAUSE score, which is the alcohol withdrawal severity score predictor, which you can get on the on your MD Calc app uh, is quite effective and predicts the risk of uh, alcohol withdrawal in the hospital is easy to administer, and if you're seeing a patient who has a pause score, you know of uh, four or more, uh, they are at high risk of going into withdrawal. And given everything I've just taught you about phenobarb, I think it's uh, it's very reasonable to just load these people either orally or. IV with 10 per kilo, it's not likely to cause a lot of sedation uh, in these folks uh, and might stave off uh, dangerous alcohol withdrawal, you know, two days into their stay or 24 hours into their hospital stay. So again, a plug for at least the consideration of prophylactic phenobarb. Uh, we're getting near the end of this, this uh, talk, but let's, let's uh, speak briefly about some kind of frequently asked questions that come up. So the first is what about discharge? Uh, what should you do after discharge? And I think that there are there are probably uh, multiple acceptable practices here, but I'll tell you what I do. Um, my preference is when I see somebody in the ER with, with definite alcohol withdrawal, I go ahead and just load all of them, unless there's a contraindication with 10 per kilo IV. I reevaluate them. And at that point, I find probably half or more of them are completely better and just want to go home. And if that's the case, I educate them about the long acting nature of the drug. Uh, and I may, I may discharge them with some Phenergan or some Zofran or something, but I don't typically give them any prescriptions to go home with. Uh, and I at least personally haven't experienced a lot of uh, fallouts there. Uh, I per personally would not give these people transine uh, for the reasons I've said. I think it probably just increases your risk of of over sedation in this patient population. And while it's probably not, you know, commonly causing huge problems, it's also probably not necessary. And if these patients are getting a lot sicker, I'd, I'd probably prefer to see them back in the hospital. And I think that's unlikely. So the second question that comes up a lot is, is there kind of a cumulative dose at which point that you absolutely have to admit these people or, or alternatively have to put them in the ICU? And you know, I would say the short answer is no, but 
with some caveats, you know, for example, if, if I've given someone 10 per kilo, they're still pretty symptomatic, have a RAS, you know, greater than zero, uh, and I'm giving them additional doses, most of those patients I'm going to, I'm going to admit, and I'm probably going to try hard at that point where I'm ordering my additional doses to, to warn the patient that that's the plan. And in my experience, that usually, you know, goes, that usually goes pretty well. Um, at the same time, you know, I would think of, again, that 20 per kilo as that threshold where I'm beginning to think of starting alternate therapies on these people, at which point they, depending on your, your hospital resources, but they're probably going to need the ICU. So at that point, over 20 per kilo, I think, is a good threshold to think this person's probably not or may not be the best candidate to go to the floor. Uh, and I think that's pretty easy sell for, for, our, for, our, for our intensivists. And then lastly, a kind of related question, when would I start Presidex, which, which I think is the best next drug? Uh, and I would say if they've gotten 20 per kilo and their RAS is greater than plus one, I would go ahead and start them on Presidex. Um, I would say that RICU at Swedish is pretty, pretty aggressive and they would, they would probably you know, consider going up to 30 per kilo. But I think for us, if it's over 20, I'm, I'm probably starting on Presidex and having a conversation with the ICU at that point. One thing I would try to avoid uh, is uh, being talked into converting over to benzos at that point. We did have a case uh, where um, our, my team had, had given 20 per kilo. The patient was still pretty sick, uh, was like a plus two RAS. And, uh, and the intensivist who was unfamiliar with phenobarb um, doesn't work at our site much, uh, kind of essentially insisted that, that we give some, some Valium before we admitted them. And sure enough, that person, you know, ended up getting intubated. Uh, and so I would, I would kind of, kind of stand your ground on that one as much as possible. So a couple of brief words about seizures. Um, you know, I think alcohol withdrawal seizures is what everyone is afraid of, particularly our patients and their family members. But um, I think we need to remember that alcohol withdrawal seizures are typically brief and self-limiting. Status epilepticus in the setting of alcohol withdrawal is very uncommon. And frankly, if it occurs, it, it really makes raises the question of something else is going on, like refractory hypoglycemia or head trauma or underlying epilepsy or some other you know, intoxicant or withdrawal state. I think everybody knows that traditional any convulsive medications are ineffective for alcohol withdrawal seizures. It is really unclear what the right doses are for these patients, but uh, typically I would just give more phenobarb if I'm already giving phenobarb. I would give, you know, let's say they're in the middle of their 10 per kilo load, they have a seizure, I would just push 130 and might, might need to do it a couple of times to get them up to a therapeutic level. Uh, one thing that I think is interesting for us to keep in mind, there's some growing body of evidence that suggests patients with recurrent alcohol withdrawal seizures that pyridoxine or vitamin B6 may be, may be playing a role. And there's some evidence to suggest that uh, giving people uh, pyridoxine is, is helpful in, in their management as well. So uh, I just wanna thank uh, everyone for their interest. Uh, we have a few minutes, I think, to take some questions. I uh, really love this topic. I hope that I've uh, explained it you know, well to you. And, and, and really more than anything, I hope that I've made some, made some converts because I think that um, this is a area of our practice where um, there's really uh, great options other than what we've traditionally done. 